At the time of the Hajj in Mecca, the worldwide Muslim community, the Ummah, is made strikingly visible. Wherever it may be, in Africa, in Asia, in America or Europe, the name of God marks the entry of a new soul into the Ummah. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah. Ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. This little girl, like a third of all Muslims, will live in a non-Muslim country. She may face many difficulties, suspicion, hostility, ignorance, even physical danger. Above all, she may struggle with the greatest issue facing Muslims in the minority today, her identity. Can she belong both to her host nation and to the Islamic Ummah at the same time? The Grand Trunk Road is the oldest road in India, running across the width of the subcontinent. Muslims have been living among the Hindus here for nearly a thousand years. Yet today we hear claims that the only true Indian is a Hindu. The village of Gabana has long been home to people of both faiths. Any questions of identity should have been settled long ago. It is easy to be fooled by appearances. The singers of this Hindu devotional song are Muslim, not Hindu. But they love to sing and in a poor village like Gabana, it seems natural to contribute whatever you can to communal life. But though Gabana is poor, much religious building work is being done in the community. The old Hindu temple is being renovated. And in the part of the village that's the focus of religious activity, almost next door to the temple, a brand new mosque is beginning to take shape. In this village at least, nobody seems to think that belonging to a different religion makes a person a stranger let alone an enemy. Though Muslims have lived in this area for centuries, it is only recently that they have begun building their own place of worship. और यहां पाया लगेगा और यहां पाया लगने के बाद में फिर इसमें ये सारे में लेंटर पड़ जाएगा 3 फुट छजरी आगे निकल करके उसके बाद में फिर इसमें इसका प्लास्टर है प्लास्टर होने के बाद में फिर इसका जो है इसका इसमें रंग रोगन और डिसेंबर और ये होगा गबाना सीम्स अ क्लोज्ड एंड सेल्फ सफिशिएंट वर्ल्ड टेकिंग लिटिल अकाउंट ऑफ इवेंट्स एल्सवेयर इन द सबकॉन्टिनेंट not for them, the newly rising tensions between the religious communities. Here, people's lives are so closely interwoven that the need for tolerance is no less than a matter of daily survival, 
for both Muslims and Hindus. मस्जिद बनाने का गांव वालों के सबके कोई ऐतराद नहीं था सबका सबकी लगान थी क्योंकि जब यहां लोग आबाद हुए ये मुस्लिम लोग तो इनकी सबकी यही है कि ये मस्जिद तामिर हो जाए ताकि हमारी नमाज पढ़ने के लिए जो है जगह एक बन जाए और मुकम्मल हो जाए हमें कहीं कोई परेशानी ना हो और जाने आने की कोई जरूरत ना पड़े कहीं ताकि हम यहीं अपनी नमाज अदा कर लिया करें Five times a day, in a symbol of the religious harmony of the village, Ida the singer turns his talents from Hindu devotional songs to the Muslim call to prayer. The Muslims of Gabana appear to have confidence in their identity, no difficulty with being members both of the Ummah and of Indian society. They are divided from their countrymen only by details of belief. They eat much the same food, wear much the same clothes, sing much the same songs. How can an outsider tell which of these villagers are followers of Islam and which of the Hindu god Lord Ram? And yet, not 30 miles away, Hindu militancy is putting Gabana's peaceful coexistence at risk. This is a modern Hindu religious procession. But it's not the sight of strange gods that threatens us. There's also a political message. Muslims feel intimidated by the deadly passions so easily whipped up by Hindu chauvinists. Remember, Mahatma Gandhi himself was assassinated by a Hindu extremist for trying to protect Muslims. This is Ayudhya. The mosque was built in the reign of the Mughal Emperor Babur on the site Hindus claim as the birthplace of Lord Ram. In 1992, Hindu extremists broke into the compound and destroyed the building in the course of a single day. The police looked on. Disturbances broke out over much of the country, exposing tensions simmering just below India's secular surface. It seems a world away from Gabana village, just down the road. Such strife is, I fear, nothing new. Communal violence is endemic to the subcontinent, particularly in the towns. In village India, conflicts of loyalty are an unwanted import. These distinctions are brought in from outside. They are not indigenous to the situation, right? But in the cities, in the rural, in the urban areas, among the educated classes, among the economic classes, the middle class, the lower middle class, this is a very deliberate you know, effort to create a distinct identity based on religion. You know, that creates the problems. Such problems came to a tragic head in 1947, at the time of partition of the subcontinent into Pakistan and India. Railway journeys in this part of the world have a disturbing resonance for anyone who lived through those times.
10 million people, Muslim and Hindu, left their homes. With terrible atrocities committed on all sides, as many as a million died. I was four years old and it nearly happened to me. My father had decided that along with so many other Muslims, we should move to Pakistan and booked us onto a train. But in buying food for the journey, we missed our connection and had to travel a day later. We arrived safely in Pakistan, but the train that we should have taken was stopped just short of the border. Not a single passenger survived. Such memories color the reaction of India's Muslims to the conflicts in Ayodhya and Kashmir. Ayodhya today, they say, where next? In India, as in many places all over the world, age-old Muslim communities are being threatened by changes not of their own making. In spite of a thousand years of shared history, some Hindus are now refusing to accept the Muslims' Indian identity. Many of those hundred million or more people are asking themselves, who are we and where else is there for us to go? ये हिंदू परिषद के वर्कर हाथों में नंगी तलवारें लिए यूं खड़े हुए हैं ये देखिए आप मुरादा फरमाइए ये सिर्फ मुसलमान के लिए है अगर मैं भी जामे मस्जिद से ऐलान कर दूं कि ऐ मुसलमान तू भी हथियार बंद हो जा तू भी अपने घरों में फैक्ट्रीज कायम कर ले और तलवारें नंगी अपने हाथों में लेके खड़ा हो जा क्या होगा फिर ये यकतरफा मामला है पुलिस इनको देख रही होगी गवर्नमेंट को मालूम है और ये देखिए अखबारात में फोटो भी आ गए हम निहत्ते और ये हिंदू परिषद विश्व हिंदू परिषद जो मुसलमान का इस वक्त खूनी दुश्मन है खून का प्यासा है इफ मेनी मुस्लिम्स फील एलिएनेटेड इवन इन इंडिया विद इट्स कॉमन कल्चर एंड शेयर्ड हेरिटेज व्हाट ऑफ अदर कम्युनिटीज इमर्स्ड इन कल्चर्स ऑफ अ वेरी डिफरेंट काइंड for hundreds of years, Muslims have been traveling, establishing themselves in new lands and among new peoples. I am sailing to the Isle of Lewis off the northwest coast of Scotland to meet a community of Muslims from Pakistan who have made a home for themselves among people with very different ways. One might expect Islam and the island culture to be far apart, but in fact, the Muslim Hebrideans turn out to have much in common with their host community. Islamic is very, it's a fundamentalist religion and Presbyterianism is practiced on the island. islands here, I would say, is a very fundamentalist religion as well. So there are both probably on opposite ends of the stick, but uh, very fundamentalist and they seem to respect each other. So. Activities. And, uh, I've never seen them sort of um, open on Sundays and this type of thing. So oh, they don't, not, don't, they don't, don't open on don't, Sundays. Don't, yeah. don't. Never so have, as far as I'm aware. Sort of. Not opening on Sundays is a good way of showing respect for your Christian neighbours. It'll be interesting to see whether respect is received as well as given. The main town of the island of Lewis is Stornoway. <laughs> 
Habib Ullah and his daughter Rubina have come to meet me. They certainly look well integrated into island society. And to my ear, they sound very Scots too. Did you have a nice sailing? I first wanted to know how much they felt part of one of the most clannish and traditional communities in Western Europe. The reason why we are integrated here is because it's a small community here. There's not so many Asian or Pakistanis here and people accepted us more. And the other thing is we, we try ourselves best to mix with our local community. That's it. 15 dollars mm -hmm. Long sleeves and the short sleeves are $13.99. Uh -huh. okay. By running the biggest store on the island, the Pakistanis have made themselves indispensable to the community. We think ourselves just one of the islander now. We're living for so long here now. With a small community, there's not so much noticeable. See, on the mainland, the communities are so large and it's so, so much noticeable, and this is why people are threatened, probably. Strange as it may seem, coloured faces are not new around the Hebrides. The family came to Stornoway some 30 years ago when they were filmed for a documentary. The idea of Gaelic-speaking Pakistanis charmed the television audience. When I came here first, I found it very, very strange. And uh, for a while, I was unsettled. I thought I would leave here. You know, I didn't like it to start with. But then I start working and selling stuff out in the country with my suitcase and all that. And I reasonably got on all right. So I was beginning to like. And then after about three years, I bought a shop in Stornoway. And from there, I progressed. Many Stornoway people are deeply committed Christians. As strict Scottish Presbyterians, their values are not so very far from the values of Islam. Perhaps this is the key to the Muslim sense of ease. This is Stornoway on a Sunday. We don't believe in opening on Sunday, not whatsoever. We don't do anything at all, you know, which will offend the local community. And we think it's, it will be wrong to do so. This must be one of the few places in the British Isles where propriety insists that everything be closed on the Sabbath, the Lord's Day. And by everything, they mean absolutely everything. <laughs> to ensure that no offence is given to Stornoway's Presbyterians, the Sunday football game is held well out of sight in the lee of the dunes. I confess to finding religious tolerance here a little one-sided. It is the Muslims who seem to make all the adjustments. They wouldn't think of closing their shop on Eid or building a mosque for their little community. But the Pakistanis of the Hebrides themselves don't seem to find it difficult to combine both a Scottish and a Muslim identity. I wanted to know if they felt their Muslim culture to be under threat. We're not worried. The sooner or later, any community who integrate into a, into a host community will lose their identity eventually. 
and as you know changes are always painful we would feel very very painful when change would come like this even though i won't be here at that time but i'm sure my children or their children or their children when they integrate they will feel you know probably they will be very disappointed i am a muslim but i'm also scottish i was born here i was bred here and when i first went to university i felt as most people from the island do very homesick first joined uh, Oceanic Society, which is a Gaelic society, and started taking Gaelic lessons. I think that was more to get back to my Highland roots, which I think are as much part of me as my Muslim roots are. You know, have the two, I can't ever separate the two. When I went to Glasgow, then I felt a bit ignorant about my own religion. I mean, I've been taught the basics by my family, but when I went there, I realized how much I didn't know. And so recently, in the past couple of years, I've made a concerted effort to learn more about Islam. I just wanted to know more from that standpoint. And when I did start to learn more, it, it just gave me a sense of peace. And I don't think the Muslim identity will ever fade. I think it's too strong. I mean, there's already a resurgence in the whole of the world. I don't think it'll ever feed. <laughs> Perhaps the most important pointer to a community's sense of identity comes at the end of life, when Muslims no longer want to return to their original homeland for burial, then one can say that integration is on the way to being complete. So this is the Muslim graveyard? This is the plot mm. we this bought in 1959 mm. for, all the, for all Muslims. Mm. So shall we say a prayer before? Yes. <laughs> Who's buried here, Hansam? Uh, this is my uncle's grave, Mr. Niaz Muhammad. And do most people in the community wish to be buried here? Well, we are going to be buried here because we have decided, we told our family that our remains mustn't be sent back to Pakistan. Yeah, our Punjabi are Punjabi. But brother is not the same. No, brother is not the same. But when we are The layout of Stornoway Cemetery reflects the lives of the island's Pakistani community. The Muslim section is within, but quite separate from the Christian burial ground. Stornoway has been largely spared the storm of social revolution which mainland Britain has had to weather since the Second World War. That helps account for the sense of security and identity among the island's Muslims. Things are very different in England. Berry, near Manchester, is much more typical of today. Here, amid the welter of change, a Muslim identity may be the only fixed and certain feature of an immigrant's world. Fazal Wadud, a Pathan from Pakistan, runs a workers' cafe here, exercising the Muslim duty of hospitality. <laughs> In fact, Fazal's name is very appropriate. Wadud means he who gives love, one of the attributes of God. But Fazal doesn't expect his customers to know that. No, they call me a David. Yeah, you know. Because it's easy to say, like, you know. Easy for English people to say David. It really, it's Wadud, but call myself David. For the disabled people, you will see that mentally disabled, they are all coming in here, all welcome in here. And they are quite happy in here, like, to treat them nice. Some of them by social workers, they come to see me, how is my client? Is he all right? Yeah. They are happy in here. I regard Britain as my home and I am citizen of Britain, and I love to stay in this country till the day I die.
I never had any problem in racial attack or anything like that. In 32 years, no problem. Well, I'm, well, I'm, I'm nothing against them. They're all right. They're all right with me, I'm all right with them. Fazal declares himself quite at home in Britain. But is he perhaps being over-optimistic? His wife and his daughters, they go upstairs, you know, like doing chips, but they never, ever come in here. You just see them at back, you might see them, you know, one in Ikea or something, and then if they do, his daughters put a veil over him so we can't see them. I think it's vain, that. When they're walking around with a veil on them. I mean, I can't understand it. I mean, I look at this way. If they're here, they should go our way. Do you know what I mean? Like, if we were over there, we'd have to go their way, wouldn't we? That young woman clearly does not know that when her people ruled our country, they not only lived as in Britain, but wanted to make Muslims live their way too. It seems to me that not a great deal has changed since then. He only closes it twice a year, and that's Christmas. our Christmas, not his. <laughs> he just goes praying and everybody else carries on working like you know. Older Muslims like Fazal Wadud are grateful to be here and try to fit in at all costs. The next generation, like Fazal's son who runs the amusement arcade above his father's cafe, are less prepared to shut their eyes to the difficulties and prejudices they face. Noor grew up in Britain. He has no other country. So when he finds that he is not accepted as British, his only recourse is to a Muslim, not a Pakistani identity. They don't like the Muslim somehow, you know. That's my point of view. I don't feel accepted uh, because uh, ever since uh, we come to this country, I've, uh, we've had uh, a lot of uh, English people, you know, like calling us, uh, Packies and you know things like this and uh, you know the English lads we don't like mix with them you know so that's why they don't like us and plus our religion as well we're Muslims so that puts them off you know we were let into this country you know to work really our father came because uh, we were you know we, we wanted a different style of uh, life, but still to be Muslims. But when we've come to this country, like, I mean, year, uh, years have gone by now, and, you know, with us being grown up, so we're beginning to sort of, like, mix with the English. Like, my brother, for instance, uh, going out with the English girls. To assimilate or to integrate, the great conundrum facing all minority communities. While most Pakistanis wish to be integrated into British society as Muslims, many find that they will only be accepted if they assimilate to a completely English way of life. For some, that is too much of a threat to everything they believe in. For them, the only option is to return home. Two thirds of Britain's Muslims have come from South Asia. Salikhana, in the northwest frontier province of Pakistan, has long links with Britain. These are Pathan tribal people with a warrior tradition. Their little town grew by serving the nearby army barracks during the days of British India. The graveyard at Saleh Khana is like a gazetteer of the world. People have come back home to be buried from as far afield as Britain and Brunei. For Pathans, tribal identity and honor override most other considerations. Muslims 
چکن زب از دیمال که نور نوسم زکا چیزی که به ماشومان را ولی ما نه ماشومان به دکا دکا ماشومان به بچه آتونی نمیشی چه بر بلس نمیشی اسپی اونو منو پیکی دیگه نه؟ از ما برادر دست ون از گرینگ تو اول لایک نه جنگر دن می بات لک تو می از یه نه لکس وان اوت لکس وان اوت لایک نه یا ام گلاد تو سی ام لایک نه یا لک اولدر دن یه از نو بیر بیفور it's, a, you know, it's become a bit religious, more religious. It wasn't before like this. It's quite changed. It's quite changed. Innama tunziru man ittaba zikra wa khashi rahmani bil ghaybi Fabashiruhu bi maghfiratin wa ajrin kareem Inna nahnu nuhayy al-mawta wa naktubu ma kaddamu wa asarahum Wa kulla shayin asenahu fi maamim mubin وادرب لهم مسلنا صاب الكريات زجال مرسلون إذا أرسلنا إليهم سنين فكذبوهم ما فازنا بسالس فقالوا إن إليكم مرسلون بسم الله الرحمن This is Rahim al Wadud, Fazal's brother. The brothers have made their choices. Fazal's sons have no choice. They must find a way to be British. But in between. The middle generation has one foot in each country and each culture. Here's Fazal's son-in-law, Harun. The land over there, the, the graveyard over there, it's like a magnet. What will happen one day is when we are deceased, right, it will sort of pull us to that land, right, and that's where we will be buried. When it's rain, it's pouring down. Yeah. When it's not rain for a six month or nine months, and it stay dry, yeah. but when it start raining, it rain proper. It's a beautiful smell yeah. that comes out. Yeah. Uh, you know, when the sun actually hits the rain, it absorbs the nice moisture and everything. It's really nice smell. A, a fine aroma of fresh leaves and just natural soil. I miss that, to tell you the truth. The Wadud family are not just typical Pakistani Muslims. They come from a tribal area, and their traditions and culture maintain a strong and constant pull on their loyalties, as of course does Islam. When in England, Islam instructs them to abide by British law, as is the case in any country which allows freedom of worship. Though they may apply the Sharia, Islamic religious law, in private, it is easy to underestimate the compromises Harun has to make. It was once um, said in, by a member of parliament, in fact, that we were actually, uh, people over here were actually building nations within nations, should I say. I totally disagree with that. Because, take for example myself, I've come from um, Pakistan, I've come here to live, right? I will serve this country till the day actually I die, right? But as you can see, the influence and the impact that it's had on me, it has changed me quite a lot. If I was, for example, in Pakistan, right, then I would probably be praying five times a day. I would be a completely different person to what I am here. Unlike Harun, the next generation of British Muslims has no other homeland. Neither Pakistani nor English, Islam gives them their only identity. They find it unjust that Muslims are not allowed their own state-supported schools nor, all too often, to take time off work for their festivals. Since Britain is now their country too, they want Islam recognized as another British religion. When people understand what Islam is really about, and it's not this evil ideology from the alien East come to overtake um, the Western world, as soon as people understand that and understand its beauty and understand the peace that comes from practicing Islam, there'll be no longer this idea of opposition, no longer this idea of threat. I don't think um, I'm any different to other British people who have grown up here, who live here, who are British. And in that way, I don't think anybody's done me a favor by allowing me to be here. I think I have a lot to give to Britain. And I think Britain has a lot to, um, to take from me. And in that way, it's, it's nothing to do with obligations and favors. As Muslims, I feel we have a right to demand. 
our rights, but there's ways and means of actually going about how we actually demand for those rights. We don't go around uh, uh, threatening. threatening people or having mass demonstrations, but there's ways and means of getting people representing us in, mm -hmm. in Parliament and getting our views across there so that we can have what you know what we want and that way the people I mean the parliament will cater for our needs there because we are part and parcel of society we won't ever um, try to enforce anything because that that's not Islam Islam is submission to the will of God and unless you submit to the will of God um, it you're not a Muslim so to enforce it enforce that ideology on somebody else is not to make them Muslims, is not to um, encourage them to practice Islam. It's That would be a lie and that would not be acceptable within Islam. But in Islam there's no basis for nationalism and uh, I would describe myself as a Muslim rather than a British Muslim or a Pakistani Muslim uh, because nationalism can be taken as a, as, a, as, a, as a form of God. You know, people say my country, right or wrong, or jingoism, and you could that came across in the Gulf War. So I, I would not describe myself as as a as a British or as a Pakistani. I describe myself as a as a Muslim person. True Islam indeed allows for no separate national identities, but perhaps now. For the only time in their lives, these pilgrims to Mecca will not be divided by class, race or nationality. But when they return home, most of them will face a world in which national allegiance plays an ever greater part. In India, some question whether Muslims can ever be loyal to the state. In England, there are those who judge Muslims by their support for the national cricket team. Yet others will return to countries where, until recently, they were not permitted to express their Muslim identity at all. I've come to Dagestan in the Caucasus, southwest of Russia. Pilgrims returning from the Hajj have taken over the airport for a spontaneous Sufi ritual in praise of God. In communist times, these people might have faced losing their jobs, their liberty, even their lives. For 70 years, the ban on Islam was enforced, even in this remote region. Stalin's rule was brutally heavy-handed. As a Caucasian himself, he knew that these mountain villages have had a long history of resistance to Russian rule. Their spirit had to be broken. <laughs> Uh, he said, can you imagine I, I not, not to be sad if uh, my father is invalid, if my relatives dead, and if I came to a different place, to people with different language, different nations, and if I had to survive here. Certainly, I, uh, he said that he would be, become sad. 
And how did he survive then? How did he pick up his life? Allah. Allah. God, Allah helps. The interior of Dagestan was too mountainous and too inaccessible for the communists ever to maintain total control over the people. Islam survived, indeed flourished, in secret seclusion. The village of Gubden now has 30 mosques. Even during the Brezhnev years, many of the houses were given Arabic inscriptions. With the coming of the Gorbachev era, Dagestan's Muslim leadership at last felt able to reassert their religious values and to protest at their treatment. Целиком, как во всей стране, по союзу считать, и как в Дагестане тоже, они целое поколение испортили. И именно начиная с моего селения, были особенно ученые арабисты, затем, за кем шел народ, были расстреляны. Значит, осталось остальное... Масса людей, которые неграмотная масса, которые, возможно, было, они повели за собой. И изменили то устой жизни, то культуру. Все это было уничтожено, и целая эпоха пошли мы назад. A thousand miles east, in Central Asia, reasserting an Islamic identity has been an even less peaceful process. At the end of 1992, the newly independent Republic of Tajikistan exploded into civil war between the Democratic Islamic Alliance and former Communist President Nabiyev, seen here. Trouble had begun that summer. Far from being fundamentalists on the march, the Tajik religious authorities were quite clear that first they were aiming for a democratic state and only eventually an Islamic constitution. My own impression is that the people of Central Asia do not want yet another political upheaval, but to be allowed to restore their suppressed traditions, reassert their forbidden culture, and resurrect their almost but not quite forgotten faith. So great is the need to renew religious expression that the notices condemning tomb worship as un-Islamic are mostly ignored. We are at the shrine of Bahuddin Naqshband, one of the greatest saints of Central Asian Islam, whose teachings helped sustain the people of the former Soviet Union during their long night. Now the Muslims of Central Asia are slowly, tentatively, and rather movingly rediscovering their cultural and spiritual inheritance. It is a pious duty to prepare food for pilgrims to the shrine. Mm. 
A young boy recites from the Quran, I was astonished. How had the Muslim identity been preserved through 70 years of communist atheism? I asked where the boy had learned the Quran. His grandfather, I was told, had taught him in secret. And here he sits, the proud grandfather. Clear evidence of the old man's loyalty to the Soviet state is pinned to his lapel. Yet the Quran was his way of resisting communist control of his mind. This is the memory I will always keep of Central Asia. Joining the Cosmopolitan Congregation in London's principal mosque and looking back at my travels across the Muslim world, I am struck by both the unity and the diversity of Islam. One God, one book, one prophet unite very different peoples. What I'm trying to say is that Islam in all of these communities uh, should develop an indigenous tradition. You know, it sounds a little awkward to the Muslims as a whole that there'll be several Islams. There'll be British Islam, there'll be American Islam. It sounds rather, you know, dangerous, but actually, Ultimately, this is what's going to happen. That is, if these societies have to develop roots in the, where they are in their societies of residence, they will have to indigenize a, a religious tradition that would enable them to live as British Muslims or as German Muslims or as American Muslims, at the same time have a satisfying Islamic life. It's the Islamic life that makes the Ummah a reality. The majority need have no fear, for outside the Islamic world, it is religion, not politics, that unites us. If they can accept that fact and be a little tolerant and understanding of our particular needs, I believe Muslims will come to play their full part in the life of the nation.